is a 40. All right, so this is a 41 year old man with paresthesia for two months. Do I stop here? Can I just hear a neural word? <laughs> Yay, Lee, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so should I start, Robbie? I just got really excited when I heard paresthesias because it's something that is really interesting. First, you know, the definition of paresthesias, it's, some, it's something that, you know, I try to avoid with all of the cases, but especially with neuro cases, you know, the term we give uh, a symptom can be very misleading. And for paresthesias, I think that is truer than for any others. Uh, so sensory, so I'll take this as sensory abnormalities as a whole. And that is something, you know, it all depends on where uh, the sensory abnormalities are because localization gives so much information for uh, the neurodiagnosis. So for example, the having paresthesias in both extremities uh, lower extremities is something that we see very common and it's not rare. A lot of our diabetic patients have it and, you know, it's not that rare, but whenever we see, I don't know, paresthesias of a thoracic dermatome, it suddenly becomes really interesting. Um, I actually, you know, I, I had a paresthesia I had paresthesias recently. I was taking a medication. I'm not going to say which one, but uh, one of its adverse effects is paresthesias. And it was so strange to have it. I, you know, self-diagnosing myself was like the weirdest thing because sensory abnormalities are something that, you know, it's so, sort of like pain, like abdominal pain. And everybody has abdominal pain sometimes <laughs> and it just comes and goes and there's no diagnosis. It doesn't mean that you have any underlying disorder or just something that randomly happens or please at least say it does because then I like I will get to feel normal but I started having like paresthesias of um my hands and at first I was like oh this is normal this is just me being weird on a day um randomly but then it then it got worse it was very painful and I was like huh this might be something and so you know whenever I hear sensory abnormalities first I try to define what it is uh, for that person than the localization. So uh, trying to be, you know, it can, it can even be like very broad on like extremities or uh, it can be very specific. So for example, we know that, you know, the, hand and the, the hands and um, feet, you know, are affected by demyelinating disorders that are limb dependent um, and then Time course is always very important. So I think that would be like my overall schema. Robbie, what do you think? The ending with E equals MC square is amazing. I love that. Um, and I love the personal touch to it. I think it makes it so much more memorable. And, you know, I agree with you. Like the paresthesias is a, is a phenomenon that is purely experienced. And so um, being able to get at as much detail as you possibly can on said experience is really important. And I would say that um, it's, it's incredible how quickly you move into like thinking about a regular old peripheral neuropathy when you hear that. And you have to be careful because the truth is whenever you hear paresthesias, you're going to be going into regular old peripheral neuropathy, which is idiopathic, alcohol, diabetes, uh, familial, and obesity related. Those are the top five causes, but you have to slam the brakes and at least consider two, po two other possibilities. The first is that you have what is an atypical distribution, as you said, Maria. So if it starts in the hands or ascends very quickly or um, doesn't behave like a typical neuropathy, you have to say, wait, my localization may be different. But I'd say more importantly, and there's, there it might be a non-neurologic problem. And this is the biggest caveat. So how can paresthesias be a non-neurologic problem? Take a pause and remind yourself, what are the classic symptoms of Raynaud's phenomena? Pain, pallor, paresthesias that come and go. Paresthesias may be a sign of ischemia to the peripheral nervous system and are commonly a feature of peripheral ar arterial disease, which when patients exert themselves, they get pain and then paresthesias. So the biggest caveat here is to make sure that you're not dealing with an ischemic problem to the limbs, like PAD or Raynaud's, and then uh, making sure you're dealing with, an, with a typical localization. Um, and so I'm right there with you. A lot of detail about this paresthesia is going to be really important. And we're probably going to go into one of three spaces, regular old neuropathy, 
fancy neuro stuff or non-neuro at all and think about ray nodes, PAD and stuff like that. Um, given the uh, clinical reasoning enthusiasm of our friend Lee, Lee here, I don't think we're gonna go into garden variety neuropathy, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> all right, so do I continue? All right, so the, patients ha the patient had been uh, traveling in Indonesia two months ago. He ate a fish stew and several hours later developed nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. The GI symptoms resolved, then several days later re developed a sensation of numbness in his legs traveling towards his upper body. And symptoms have been uh, improving. Symptoms have improved over the last two months, but have not resolved. The numbness, however, has now resolved, but has a odd sensation in his legs and he feels a burning sensation when he touches cold objects. Hmm. This is super interesting. I, I'm trying to run away from like my thinking fast processes. So I'm gonna go first with anything that sort of sounds triggering for something is something that I try to evaluate if it actually is consequential or if it's just something that happens uh, randomly in this world. There's a lot of coincidences. Um, I loved my, one of my math teachers in school, he would always say that, you know, like, um, you know, if you have enough data, nothing will be a coincidence. Um, but overall, you know, I think the human mind just likes to lump things together. So whenever we hear, for example, you know, the fish and the diarrhea, and then we sort of hear prosthesias or like sensory abnormality, you know, our mind just goes into like clumping them together, um, which is what I did in like my thinking fast process of, you know, sensory abnormalities or like motor abnormalities after a diarrheal process for me is Guillain-Barre until proven otherwise. And, you know, somebody asked in, in, um, in the chat, the Guillain-Barre cause prosthesis, and then I see Vale answering with what I was going to say, that there are so many variants of GBS, and there are so many presentations. Uh, you know, I, some, like somebody very close to me had a very atypical presentation of GBS, so I always try to be very broad. I sort of like how I think of multiple sclerosis in the sense of, you know, any new sensory abnormality in a young person could be uh, multiple sclerosis, then I always think like any motor, sensory, or autonomic abnormality in a person after a diarrheal process or after like a, an atypical, you know, or like a regular um, influenza infection or something, you know, it always brings my GBS. And especially because of how fast it can develop and how life threatening it can be if it affects uh, respiratory muscles. So I always try to try to have it in my mind, even if it starts in your legs or if it starts in your um, fingers or whatever, you know, anything, I try to have it in my mind. Uh, but I think it, it's interesting how it resolves. So he has numbness along his upper body and then this odd sensation along his legs that we would love to characterize a little bit more. And then it resolves and then he continues with a burning sensation. Um, so I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't know if, I think I'm at like at the process of, I don't know. <laughs> like I, I am not sure what this burning sensation is or I go to nerves immediately um, localizing it to some sort of uh, neuropathy, but hopefully Robbie will keep us away from the neuro and avoid me going too fast into something that might not be neurological at all. You know, you're not fast at all. You're so um, meticulous in your thinking. And, and I just love that in, that caveat, which is just because two things occur at the same time doesn't mean that there's a causal relationship. That is proof that you're not going too fast and thinking about this in the exact right way. And I think by mentioning Guillain-Barre and by mentioning multiple sclerosis, you're taking us into the bucket I think we should go into, which is, is this is not regular old peripheral neuropathy. That's all you can really know, right? And I think that the story here is um, 
very compelling and not compelling for a vascular cause. So we're in that fancy smancy neurologic bucket, as you alluded to. And the way you made the case for that is superb that I don't, I don't think I need to spend any time to, uh, um, to reinforce that. And I just want to show people visually what that space looks like real quick, um, which is most of the time when you hear these words, you'll be like, oh, I'm dealing with a distal, slow, symmetric, sensory predominant paresthesias, and it's probably because diabetes will be like this stuff. And what happens, you go to neuropathy 2.0 very quickly when there are atypical features. And the first one here is it's abrupt, right? So done. And neuropathy 2.0 means you need an EMG unless you have prominent clues on the exam to tell you. And the EMG can tell you, hey, maybe you're dealing with myelopathy like multiple sclerosis, or maybe you're dealing with an atypical neuropathy. And that's all that you, that you can confidently say in this case, is that this is an atypical uh, neuropathy and uh, so may not be a neuropathy at all, or maybe a sexy neuropathy like perineoplastic or ALS or, or, um, or a thymine deficiency, so on and so forth. Um, but for the sake of practice, I will tell you that Lee has actually given us features pathognomonic of a very specific disease. But it would be um, poor form to share that now. But I want you to make a pin in it because the goal will be if you don't recognize it now, I want you to recognize it by the end of our time together. So the answer is here now. And our growth will be going from being confident that this is not a regular neuropathy to saying, how could we know the answer now? And the, the landscape of atypical neuropathy is dominated by toxins and medications. So remember what Maria shared about her story? Her neuropathy, as she described, was an atypical neuropathy because it began in the arm. It involved, it very quickly involved the upper extremities, very unusual. So medications and toxins are a very, very um, notorious cause of atypical neuropathy. But in real life, this case is Guillain-Barre until proven otherwise. So you really want to do a, a good exam to make sure the reflexes are intact, so on and so forth, to make sure that the scary causes of atypical neuropathy, namely Guillain-Barre, are excluded. Um, but let's go back and revisit this aliquot when we're done to put the pieces together um, for Lee's fantastic case. All right, Lee, do you mind, I know the human DXs are broken in a, in, a, in a certain way. Do you want to just take us all the way up until the exam? Actually, the next aliquot is from the exam. There's nothing much Perfect. in this. Perfect. All right, so the temperature is 98.4 Fahrenheit. Uh, heart rate's at uh, 72. Blood pressure is uh, 121 over 83. Respiratory rate is 18. And on general exam, uh, you, the patient looks uh, well and comfortable. Okay, on mental status exam, uh, he's alert and oriented, oriented times three. Uh, he has normal bulk and tone, um, five out of five strength in bilateral uh, upper and lower extremities. Sensation to light touch and vibration are intact. Finger nose finger uh, test is intact and Romberg test is negative. That's it for the physical exam. Ooh, my turn. I think this is gonna be the last aliqua before I have to run, but I think it's, um, let me just read it again, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, multitasking is something that I'm trying to avoid in my life and I'm trying to be present. So I'm going to very try to like focus a lot on this aliquot right now. And I think, I don't know, I'm not getting a lot of information from this, but there's some, there, you know, sometimes when we have negative findings, that doesn't move us like closer to a diagnosis, but that moves us away from certain things that would be really scary. So I, I was expecting to be scared by something, um, you know, like chronic disease, right? I um, and with the exam, I can, 
sort of comfortable really rule out chronic disease. I don't see any atrophy. I see normal reflexes. Um, that is comforting for me. Uh, also, you know, like seeing the vitals and those being normal, that is also very comforting to me. So right now, I don't think I've been, I'm moving any closer to the diagnosis. I'm sure Robbie already knows the answer, but for me, it's still in the process of getting an EMG and, you know, checking reflexes with uh, Guillaume Ray. You, you, it evolves so fast. Aaron tells this story that he once when he was a new York resident, he was, he comfortably said like, this is not glamorous because he has all his reflexes. And then a couple hours later, he went back and the reflexes were gone. So this is somebody that I would keep a close eye in uh, and also do an EMG, but some so like, I don't, I, mean, I don't know what else. Yeah. Robbie, help. <laughs> You don't need help, my friend. That's exactly right. You have to pay attention to the fact that this syndrome may evolve and you're very glad that the patient has no weakness, but you don't have the reflexes yet and you have to make sure that they don't drop on you. But I think um, when you're, what you're seeing here is I think a very, um, is what is, plagues us with sensory complaints was you're seeing an essentially a normal exam. And that's the hard part about paresthesias, right? Is that patients, especially with small fiber neuropathy just have discomfort without any uh, physical exam findings. So the probability of multiple sclerosis, the probability of Guillain-Barre is lower, especially because this patient has been having symptoms for many days now. Guillain-Barre at its onset can be very difficult to diagnose, but now two months in, it's probably um, very unlikely. So I, um, um, one, thank you, Maria, for joining us. I know you have to do many, many things. I will um, tell you the answer. I'll text you the answer um, when um, Lee tells us it at the end. Um, but here's, here's the key thing. I think, um, I think you're spot on. Um, I think Maria's spot on. I think what you really need is an EMG in this case, but what you can do in the meantime is ask yourself, what are the weirdest features of this case? And I would say, um, that there's two, there's two things that are very weird. One, perioral paresthesias. It's the, the differential diagnosis for perioral paresthesias is very, very small. If they're on one side, they may represent compression of the ipsilateral um, uh, uh, trigeminal nerve in many, many different locations. But once they're bilateral, without any other findings, they tend to reflect some systemic diseases. And there's really two of them, hypocalcemia, and the other is the effects of toxins. But what is very pathognomonic for a very specific condition is the reverse temperature sensation. So um, that is characteristic of a specific kind of poisoning called ciguatera poisoning. And what that, for reasons we don't understand, it is it may, the only cause that I know of, and it may be a knowledge gap, that causes the inverse sensation. When you have something hot, it feels cold. When you have something cold, it feels hot. It's called cold allodynia and reversal of cold and warm. Um, it causes a lot of people to have tooth pain and stuff like that. So what would I be doing in real life? I think in real life, I would be now asking myself, what are the other manifestations of ciguatera poisoning and how do I clinch that diagnosis? And the other big manifestation of ciguatera poisoning is effects on the heart. So I think an EKG counterintuitively is probably the most important thing to do in this patient. And then um, ruling out other things through the EMG is maybe something you'll pursue, or maybe you'll say, hey, I think this case is so suggestive of ciguatera poisoning that I will, because of the, um, um, uh, because of the uh, features we discussed, that I will just empirically treat the patient with anti-neuropathy medications and see what happens. All right, Lee, back to you. So uh, this is the final aliquot. Um, so normal and negative everything. So uh, like uh, CBC, uh, the WBC count is eight, the hemoglobin is 14, platelets at 220, uh, CMP is normal, uh, TSH, B12, vitamin E is normal, ANA is negative, ESR, CRP normal, uh, HIV is negative, uh, syphilis, is, syphilis screen is negative, uh, lumbar puncture, uh, is also uh, everything is normal. All the all the white blood cells, proteins, glucose, they're all normal. Uh, and on imaging, uh, MRI brain is normal. Uh, MRI of the cervical spine is also normal. Yeah, 
Yeah, Lee, and I think what you're highlighting here is like how important it is to um, to augment the case for um, a poisoning is by ruling out other things. And I think the more he gets better, the more other things are ruled out, and the more you get to reflect on how specific his temperature reversal and his peroral numbness, the more confident you are about this diagnosis, which is a very tricky one because you never really lock it in without that specific exposure as far, as far as I know. So what would I do now? You might ask him about what kind of fish he was exposed to because it, classically it is actually specific fish in warm water. So tropical water, presumably Indonesia would, would meet that criteria. Um, and a lot of people get better over time, um, which hopefully he will continue, though the discomfort can be debilitating and often requires um, um, uh, gabapentin or other similar medications. So I would, I would probably um, empirically treat him um, and see how he does. What did you learn? Tell us what, what, Bonner, what you learned from this case. Me? Well, uh, I learned to keep the diagnosis brought in the beginning and try to uh, use the schemas brought, brought to me by the CP solvers to like uh, try to narrow down my diagnosis to uh, a certain... Uh, yeah, a certain range of possible possibilities. And in this case, um, yeah, the, the final diagnosis is cyclotaratoxin. Yeah, it was a, uh, it was a uh, clinical diagnosis and it's made on, based on his travel history and fish consumption. Awesome, Lee, thank you so much for presenting it. What did you learn about cyclotara from, from your reading and from this case? I actually um, heard about Ciguatera when I was studying for step one, and I was quite surprised to like find it in the real case. Yeah, so um, just now you mentioned that it's, uh, it's very characteristic of some fish. So let me just look it up. I remember uh, it's a couple of fish, yeah. Larger fish higher in the food chain, like barracuda, uh, amberjack, moray eel, and groupers. And uh, the toxin is found in temperate climates, uh, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico and the Indian Ocean. Yeah, so it's pretty incredible. Wow. incredible. That's awesome. Yasmin, you seem to have some uh, experience with this. Can you tell us more? You're uh, teaching us a lot in the chat. Uh, no, but, actually, we, we have heard about that, but we, we, I have never seen one. It's just because yeah. it's like geographically um, like important for us, we have to learn it. <laughs> Incredible. That's so, so cool. Yeah, I think, um, Lee, this is such an awesome case to bring bring to us here because I think it highlights how when you hear paresthesias, you have to first say, which of the three buckets am I going into? Am I going into the typical stuff, which is symmetric, sensory predominant, slowly progressive distal neuropathy? That's like 99% of the time. And then the other 1% of the time is, wait, it's not neurologic at all. It's a vascular problem like Raynaud's or PAD. And then sometimes it's a very unusual neurological problem. And the way you know it's unusual is because the distribution is off, the tempo is off. And then an unusual neurological problem, honestly, um, is very, very tricky to figure out. And then EMG will tell you, are you dealing with a central nervous system, peripheral nervous system? And if it is peripheral nervous system, is it axonal? Is it demyelinating? Is it both? So um, yeah, I think... Um, there's not many diseases that, that do this. So perioral, perioral tingling or numbness, hypocalcemia and ciguatera is really the two C's, calcium and ciguatera. Um, it stuck with me because um, there's a New England Journal case. So if you're looking for more um, practice or another case to explore this, just type in New England Journal of Medicine, ciguatera poisoning. That's the first time I ever heard of this. And when you hear something like this once, you'll never forget it. Perioral numbness and reversal of temperature, it's so characteristic. So um, I hope you recognize this forever and ever and ever. And hopefully it's anchored in the two C's around the mouth, um, calcium and ciguatera. Yeah, yeah, James. I'm not sure if it's um if it's in the CPS cases or if it's a regular old CPC, but if you type in New England Journal um, and ciguatera, you should be able to find it. If not, then um, I'll have to find the link and send it, share it with you guys over email. All right, Deborah, you want to take us home with your recap? Hey everyone, thank you for the case. Um, it was really good. So going for the teaching point, we thought about paresthesia. We have to think about the sensory abnormalities, the extremities, if can be in the upper of the lower, in the thoracic, that we can think about the dermatomes in the hands and feet. 
And then we think about the time, if it's acute, chronic, too acute, and the most common cause that could be idiopathic, alcohol, and diabetes. And we thought about the renal that could cause pain, pallor, and paresthesia. That can be a ischemic problem. And then we thought about the neural causes that could be Guillain-Barré or multiple scler sclerosis. And then we thought about the atypical cause that could be for toxins and medication. And then we have the paralysis of the trigeminal that could be from calcium toxins. And yeah, and then we thought about, uh, Ravi just said, that we have to think first typical, that is 99% or could be vascular or can be an usual um, neurological problem. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. That was a, such a concise and awesome summary. And thank you, Lee, for presenting a really, really interesting case. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you for uh, being a longtime VMR friend. And we're excited to get to know you better next time. All right. Well, happy Thursday and um, see you next time. Aye.